It's my distinct pleasure to welcome Reverend Sonia Davidson in this hat <laughs> to the podium as she'll give her a wonderful message of enlightenment and illumination. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. Thank you, Reverend Anim Fanny. That's my pet name for her. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. And we reach our hearts out to those on the World Wide Web. It's Christmas time coming up. And we remember Jesus the Christ, the Master, who was a messenger that has survived, his message has survived all these many years, thousands of years. I can tell you that I fell in love with Jesus fully when I discovered this teaching. I really fell in love with Jesus. So my talk is focused on what made me fall in love with Jesus, the message, the message. And so I chose for my talk this morning, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of Heaven. That's my title, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of Heaven. And I start with a story which inspired me to choose this particular theme. A woman in her early 40s, who I'll call Miss Sika, although she has given me permission to share her story. She visited my practice for the first time, and as often happens with me and my patients, we got to talking about her life. She literally gushed with pleasure and gratitude for her life as it was now, as she shared her story with me. She said, I had taken a pledge some time ago, a pledge with myself to get to know God. I really wanted to know God better, to get close to God. Those are her words. She went on to tell of her early life growing up as a middle child who was ignored by her paternal grandmother in favor of her two sisters, who she said were showered with favors and affection and praise by her grandmother while she was ignored and often criticized. Yeah. <laughs> Years passed and Miss Seeker's parents had died, and she was now a single parent of a nine-month-old child. And with limited resources, she was managing. One day, she came home to find a stranger at her gate with the said grandmother, who was now 93 years old. The stranger told her that she had come to her as a last resort to get someone to keep grandmother as a grandmother's last child had died and the two favorite grandchildren who are now quite well off were unwilling to take responsibility for grandma because they were too busy. Miss Seeker said, grandma took one look at her and said, look what me come to, that I have to live with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I cried. <laughs> Miss Sika said nothing. She just took her grandmother's hand, thanked the stranger, and all that night she cried torrents of tears uncontrollably. By morning, there was a strange feeling of relief, as if years of repressed feelings had found an outlet of escape in her tears. She said quietly, Lord, is this how you are teaching me to know you? Years passed and grandmother 
eventually quietly and peacefully slipped away in her, in her bed at 113 years. <laughs> After a hearty meal and goodbye, as for her bath and put on her good dress, ate her meal and then slipped away. But these years before were filled with powerful lessons and climaxed in a most unexpected way. Shortly after Grandma came to live with Miss Seeker, a previously unknown to her grandson of Grandma's, who had become a very rich man while living abroad, turned up saying, I hear you have taken in my grandmother and are taking care, good care of her. I will give you anything you need to care for her, to care for yourself and your child. In the ensuing years, Miss Sika lacked for nothing material. The rich relative provided, including an offer to pay for her daughter to go to university. But that was not all. Miss Seeker's care for grand, cared for Grandma with affection, and ever so slowly, Grandma thawed towards her. By the time of her death, Grandma had come to, the, to be to the little family everything that one would want in a relative. She was fully active, supportive, and loving, and equally loved in return. She took complete charge of the household, including um, helping in the growing of her great-grandchild. She took over Miss um, Seeker's wedding and was, I mean, just did everything she could. Shortly before she left, Grandma said to Miss, Keep, Miss Keeper, I love you, thank you. I always knew you were stronger than you knew that you were. Miss Siva said to me, to get close to God, I had to learn to love even those who did not love me. Even those who did not love me. She had found even more, she had found the material, but most of all, she had found the beauty and the freedom of knowing that she was not only loved, but capable of deep love. On my way down in the taxi this morning, I had a very interesting one-way conversation with my, the taxi driver. The other, he was, it was coming from him. And he poured out such a message to me that I thought there were no coincidences and I would share it with you. Um, he said, you know, people spend too much time putting handcuffs around their minds. He said, when they have handcuffs around their hands, everybody can see it and they can know it. But when it is in their minds, sometimes they are not sure what it is that is chaining them. All they have to do is to free their minds and there is a world out there for them to experience. He said, look at it. Some people live in Kingston and they never know that they can go to the country and make a life for themselves. They stay in Kingston and say, I have nothing. And yet some people come from the country and come to Kingston and make something of themselves. Do you know it's because those persons have not learned to free their minds of the handcuffs that chain them. So I know that in knowing this, I understand that the freedom will come when we recognize where our source lies. And that is why it is so topical for me and so important. You see, the messages are all around, you know. Part of the freedom is to know that around you, everywhere, there's a message waiting to be heard. Sometimes we don't hear it, although our ears accept it, because yes, the chains are on our own minds because we expect to hear them only in church or in a book. Jesus said in Matthew 6.63, as you heard in our 
the inspiration reading. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things, I say all things, shall be added unto you, all things. Who is a seeker of the kingdom of God? You know, literally a seeker is one who deliberately, intently, assiduously, relentlessly pursues a desire to its fulfillment. A seeker after the spiritual path knows that there is more to life than what we can touch, taste, feel, and see. The seeker may not be exactly sure in what form a desire will be fulfilled because desires are very deep sometimes and have to be filtered through a consciousness that is conditioned to expect things to happen in a particular way. Nonetheless, this urge within propels and provides a confidence to the seeker that there is something more to be experienced. The early sea goers, explorers who went to sea were seekers. The ancient, our ancient ancestors who made the first tentative steps out of Africa to populate the world were seekers. Abram, who journeyed from Babylon to ex escape from depravity, his perception of depravity, had no idea where he would end up, but he knew that it would be somewhere good. John Glenn personified a seeker who was willing to participate in the first outer space journey by becoming the first person to circle the Earth. It is the nature of mankind to seek. That is one of the characteristics of being human. While many are pursuing outer space with frantic haste in the quest for an alternative planet for mankind to inhabit, yet others are just as intently pursuing the conquest of inner space. How much more might we gain by placing our priority on inner awareness? A seeker of the kingdom of God is not a status. To be a seeker is not a status symbol. It is an attitude that is practiced in everyday life. A seeker has a strong desire to grow. A seeker hungers and thirsts after righteousness. A seeker knows and accepts that one can grow spiritually and knows that to grow, one must be transformed by the renewing of the mind. A seeker is willing to keep the mind stayed on God. A seeker practices the presence by interpreting all experiences in the light of good of God. My message started with two such experiences. Free your minds and look at everything, whether you label it as uncomfortable, painful or not, there is a lesson there. A seeker is convinced that God is everywhere evenly and equally present. And in that conviction, a message always presents itself. A seeker is willing to spend time on formal spiritual practices. Practices that have been validated by experience over thousands of years, and yes, by research, which has proven to enhance spiritual awakening. As a seeker progresses spiritually, he or she imbibes more and more of these ideal qualities tries to observe, as I said, everything from a spiritual perspective, focuses on remembering God in all things, attempts to give the credit of each action to God. So when we are, we are congratulated for something we have done, we don't say, oh, it's no big thing, or we have a lovely dress, we say, thank you, because it is all God. And in refusing to accept this, we are in fact taking the praise for ourselves. To, a, to be a seeker is a choice, but whether we see ourselves consciously as seekers or not, the universe is indifferent. 
for we each must grow towards knowing who we are as expressions of the living spirit almighty, the bearer of the flame of Christhood. Emerson said, the universe sits in smiling repose, and I say indifferent to our individual choices. What are some of these practices, spiritual practices, that can help us? I won't go into it. I'm inviting you to come to the next class that we have on spiritual practices. I'm looking and smiling at one of our most avid and enlightened participants in our class. We at the Temple of Light have just completed a series of classes which revised and introduced various spiritual practices. The participants spent time in practicing and appreciating the value of the following, affirmative prayer, inspirational reading, meditation, contemplation, sitting in the silence, walking meditation, that's a labyrinth, journaling, visualization, visioning, mindfulness in movement, in movement in the form of yoga and tai chi, and also in fellowship. Most important, they benefited so much for the communion of spirits amongst themselves. They were invited to set aside time each day to include from this menu of practices to choose a regular schedule of practice. They were asked to observe the effect which this way of living had on how they experienced life. The reports were absolutely inspiring. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. And then where is this kingdom? Last week, Reverend John reminded us of the passage in the Bible in which Jesus clearly concurred with ancient mystical tradition's understanding of man's relationship to God. In St. Luke 17, verses 20 to 21, said, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is, huh? how many of you were here last week? The kingdom of God is within you, or within man, within you. Interestingly, ancient Egyptian proverb read from hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics, the kingdom of heaven is within you, it says, and whosoever shall know himself shall find it. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. The kingdom of heaven is within you, and whosoever shall find himself shall find it. Imagine. And Lao Tzu, those of you who know to pronounce Asian, am I right? Lao Tzu, Tzu. At the center of our being, you have the answer, he says. You know who you are, and you know what you want. God, who made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. That's from the Bible. And not to be left out, our religious science, Declaration of Principles, there are several verses, call them verses, several paragraphs. But the ones that stand out as relevant to what I'm talking about this morning refers to heaven on earth. It says, I believe the kingdom of heaven is within us and that I experience a kingdom to the degree that I become conscious of it. And the, the one titled personal freedom, I believe that ultimate goal of life is, is complete emancipation from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. I believe in the unity of all life and that the highest God and the innermost God is one God. And finally, I believe that God is personal to all who feel his indwelling presence. So seek ye 
not seek another person's, right? You can't seek for another person. You have to do it for yourself. Everyone has to go within for themselves. I believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. Jesus was a seeker. Did you know that? But he was also a finder. When Jesus was preparing for his ministry, a story is told of him which I find fascinating, being a mother. It comes from Luke 2, 41 to 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, he went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. You know what would happen if he did that in Jamaica. But they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. What a boy. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him. It's a good thing they didn't have Twitter and Facebook those days. <laughs> in the temple and Google, in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, what a nice mother, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Hear what the boy said. Why were you searching for me? He asked, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Who knows except that his experience in the temple might have awakened something in him, a quest, a, a, a divine spark might have been kindled something. What a wise mother and what a public figure Jesus became. Well, little is heard about Jesus in the ensuing years until he began public ministry at the age of 32. We can only imagine what those, these years were like. But I have little doubt that it was spent in spiritual practice, seeking the kingdom of God, which he told us was in man. At the start of his public journey, Jesus went aside into the wilderness, we were told, for 40 days and 40 nights. We do not know if this was a physical space only to which he isolated himself, but we do know that while in the wilderness of his inner space, he was beset with a lot of potentially unruly, obstructive thoughts. Jesus had prompt, a prompt answer for each as he dismissed them one by one. Those of us who are meditators know what it is like when we first begin the practice. We have great expectations, false mostly, of perfect stillness with no thoughts. Instead, of, instead, all sorts of thoughts come intruding into our awareness, tempting us to resist them or put the practice aside by saying it is not working. Jesus appeared to have a similar experience, but continued to endure the experience until he was fully charged and fully prepared for his ministry. What Jesus was doing was going within to the kingdom of God from whence cometh all good. By going within, he was being lifted up. And so, in doing so, he eventually would lift all others unto him. He demonstrated repeatedly that he could look at the most extreme condition and convert it instantly into a desired condition. And he did it without lifting a finger. To prepare ourselves to receive the blooming of the attributes of God in our lives, we must approach the kingdom of God with sincerity, with deep hunger and thirst of the seeker. 
We must set our intention to give up those opinions, beliefs, habitual ways of thinking that are not in harmony with the way we wish to live. When we repeatedly and consistently place our intention to live from a consciousness of God, the law of the universe orchestrates to bring it about. Remember, Misika. To seek the kingdom of God is to place our attention in stillness and in peace upon the presence of God and to know that we are in that presence and it is in us to know that that presence is at the center of everything and that it is perfection. In that attitude, we are poised to demonstrate any desired good. We state it, declare it, imagine it, feel it, accept it, believe it, and it becomes ours. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. The righteousness of God is the right useness of the law of God. In the book, Hidden Power for Human Problems, Frederick Bales explains, we are trying to reform our deeper thought patterns to be in line with what we believe to be the thinking of the infinite thinker. Our method of doing this is not by fighting the idea of separation, but by practicing union. Not by turning from the negative only, but by turning to the positive. Thus, it is better to cultivate the consciousness of health than to fight illness. Better to cultivate the consciousness of abundance than to struggle against poverty. Better to develop the inner consciousness of loving harmony than to battle discord. Reverend Elmer Lomsden, our founder, wrote in her own handwriting, I found in a book which I inherited from her, at the bottom of that statement, it is better to light a candle than to fight the darkness. It is better to light a candle than to fight the darkness. In one line, she summarized what had been said before. So the nature of the kingdom of heaven is joy, happiness, peace, abundance, success. It is whatever we declare it to be. That is what is added unto us when we enter into the kingdom, conforming to the nature of God. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, Isaiah 30. Verse 15. So, in times of challenge, quietly say to yourself, after this mode, I am aware of the divine within me. I am aware of the divine within me. Come on, say it with me. I am aware of the divine within me. The textbook, How to Use a Science of Mind, written by our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, says it this way. No matter how impossible any situation may seem or how difficult a solution to any problem may appear, we must hold to the idea that spirit has no problem. There is no impossible situation. On the anniversary of her transition, I came upon a statement in, by Dr. Elmo, again, again in her handwriting in another book textbook, How to Use the Science of Mind. She seemed to have seek to clarify a point, and I quote, the creative law of the universe does not depend upon our faith in it to work. It will work for anyone who applies its principles correctly. Then she ends with her favorite line, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So many times she has said that. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is echoed in these words, which I'm going to ask you after I've said them, to say with me, I am the presence of radiant joy, of divine love, and perfect power. I am the presence of radiant joy, of divine love, and perfect power. Namaste. Thank you.